Today at the National Press Club, the opposition leader Anthony Albanese. Mr Albanese enters this election year ahead in the polls, but taking nothing for granted. After three election defeats for the Labour Party, he will be hoping pandemic politics can help deliver victory. Anthony Albanese at the National Press Club of Australia. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia in Canberra and today's Westpac Address. My name is Laura Tingle. I'm the club's president. As a veteran of more than 25 years' service in the federal parliament and as a regular speaker at the National Press Club, in his capacities both as a minister and more recently as leader of the opposition, today's guest Anthony Albanese needs little introduction. Today, he is taking the podium at an event that has unofficially become known as the official commencement of the political year. This year, more than many others, is likely to be an extraordinary one, an election year in the time of a global pandemic. Prime Minister Scott Morrison will address the club next week. With the government under pressure over its handling of COVID-19 and a lively debate underway about the role of government, voters are keen to know what alternative options they have. If you're following the conversation online, you can find us on Twitter. Our user handle is at Press Club Ost, and our hashtag is NPC. Please join me in welcoming Anthony Albanese. Thanks, Laura. Well, thank you very much, Laura. And I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, and I pay my respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. And I acknowledge that tomorrow is a very difficult day for our First Nations people. I want to acknowledge members of my team who are here en masse. Richard Miles, Christina Keneally, Katie Gallagher, Tanya Plibersek, Tony Burke, Linda Burney, Brendan O'Connor, Michelle Rowland, Stephen Jones, Tim Watts, David Smith, and the hero of Eden Monero, Christy McBain. And I also want to acknowledge Andrew Barr, the Chief Minister of the ACT. Australia's best days are ahead of us. Not just the better days that we're all hoping for right now, but the best our nation has ever seen. Together, we are ready for it. Australia Day is a good moment for us to reflect, to consider our blessings as a nation and to celebrate them. Perhaps that is more important now than it has been for decades. We've been through a time so challenging that none of us will ever forget it. And I know as we enter the third year of the pandemic, a lot of Australians are exhausted. They're worn down by bad news, uncertainty, inconvenience, disruption and separation from loved ones. And we look forward to the day when we can put all of this behind us. My argument to you today is that if we want to get this moment right, Australia can emerge from this once in a century crisis better, stronger, more fair and more prosperous. My case for government is that we must learn the lessons of this pandemic in order to build a more resilient Australia for the future, a better future. What stands before us now is the opportunity to build on the best qualities that characterise Australians and to realise our potential as a people and as a nation more fully than at any time in our history. The chance is ours to seize. But it requires courage and it requires vision. It requires leadership that brings Australians together. And it demands a government that steps up to its responsibilities and fulfils its most fundamental roles, to protect our people, to act as a force for good, and to change people's lives for the better. Just pushing through this pandemic is not enough. We need to learn from it. We need to use what the last two years have taught us to build a better future. Paul Keating once said that the lesson of the First World War was a lesson about ordinary people and the lesson was that they were not ordinary. We've had that same truth brought home to us these past two years. I say it every chance I get. 
the Australian people have been simply magnificent during this crisis. Calm in the midst of turmoil, looking out for each other in tough times. If I'm elected Prime Minister of this great country of ours, I see it as my deep responsibility to repay these sacrifices, to reward these efforts, to prove worthy of the generosity and bravery of the Australian people. And that means building on the lessons of this pandemic. One, a strong, properly funded public health system with Medicare as its backbone is vital to every aspect of our lives. Two, the rise of insecure workers undermined too many families' confidence in their future. Three, stripping our TAFE and training sector of investment over the last decade has led to crippling skills gaps and worker shortages. Four, the need to manufacture more things here in Australia, to be more self-reliant and to back Australian businesses, big and small, so our fate isn't held hostage to global supply chains. Five, the need for a high quality MBN, because this isn't an optional extra. It's not about downloading videos. It is fundamental to working from home, building a small business, education for our children, and vital medical consultations. And six, affordable childcare because this too is not a luxury. It's an essential part of family and working life. In a recent profile, when asked to reflect on his time in office, Mr Morrison suggested that he is not interested in leaving a legacy. For him, leaving no legacy is a conscious choice. I find this pretty remarkable. If given the opportunity, I want to make a real difference for the people of our nation and to strengthen the nation itself. I want a better future. And if I'm successful, the future we are working toward will be demonstrated to Australians by the end of Labor's first term. An Australia with rising living standards, lifted by more secure work, better wages, better conditions for small business, stronger Medicare and more affordable childcare. An Australia with more secure jobs in both existing and new industries. Industries that will be reaping the benefits of cheap renewable energy. An Australia that is secure in our place in the world, standing up for Australian democratic values and for human rights on the global stage. An Australia with robust funding for the Australian Defence Force, which rebuilds our diplomatic service, revitalises our international aid program and works closely with our American ally and regional partners in the challenges and uncertainties that lie ahead. An inclusive society where gender, race or religion are no indication of a person's opportunities or possibilities. An Australia that is reconciled with ourselves and with our history and with our, a constitutionally recognised First Nations voice to Parliament. The desire to leave that legacy for Australians with the lessons of this moment at its core will be a driving force of a Labor government that I seek to lead. Of course, the greatest crisis we have faced since the global financial crisis is the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. It is beyond comprehension that this government has actively refused to learn from this pandemic. This government has failed repeatedly on testing, tracing, vaccinations and quarantine the grand slam of pandemic failure. A Prime Minister who is repeatedly warned by experts about what is coming and given the opportunity to plan ahead, but repeatedly fails to listen and more importantly, fails to act. And while Mr Morrison talks drivel at the cricket 
and shows off the contents of his kitchen, Australians are being confronted by empty supermarket shelves. And contrary to Barnaby Joyce's extraordinary statements yesterday, Australians are dying from COVID in record numbers. Over 900 lives lost in the first 25 days of this year. Never before has Australia had a Prime Minister with such a pathological determination to avoid responsibility. He declares, it's not my job, it's not a race, it's a matter for the states. He doesn't hold a hose and he doesn't give a rats. Every action, every decision has to be dragged out of him. And so often, after all of the build up, he gets it wrong anyway. And it's always, always too little and always too late. Australia needs leaders who first show up and then step up. Not a Prime Minister who goes missing and thinks that getting out of the way helps Australians manage an unprecedented crisis in the midst of uncertain, difficult times. For all their talk of less government, they are Australia's biggest government in three quarters of a century, with the largest deficit since World War II, the largest debt, and outside of the Howard era, our highest taxing government in modern Australian economic history. Australia needs good government now more than ever. A country and a people as extraordinary as ours deserve a government to match. A government of competence and a government of integrity. A government that doesn't get out of the way, but helps to create the way. A real government is the steering wheel of a nation, not just a bumper sticker. Since Federation, we have been united from our Pacific coast to the Indian Ocean. To use Edmund Barton's phrase, a nation for a continent and a continent for a nation. On the eve of Australia Day, consider just how remarkable that is. Some talk about Federation as a mere administrative change, but it was so much more than that. It was fuelled by a belief that we could be more than the sum of our parts and an ambition to do things better and differently. When you consider how much we have achieved since Federation, that belief has been justified time and time again. Yet as we begin 2022, there is an obvious need to bring the nation back together again, to treat the states with respect rather than simply as objects of political opportunity or attack to be as concerned with the regions as with our biggest cities. We cannot be complacent in our good fortune. Even Australia is not immune to the forces of division, whether it's ideology, political opportunism, or cynical self-interest. We have seen how this plays out across the world. And this is not the path that I will take. I choose the path built on the lessons that the pandemic made so clear to us that we're stronger together, more resilient together, better together. And that is a truth that guides me as someone who now puts himself forward to be Prime Minister. It is why we need federation reform. After decades of moving towards more national consistency, with technology helping us steadily overcome the distances on our vast continent, what we've seen in recent times is a reversal of what we all thought was a once inexorable trend. More differences and less cohesion. I will change that. I will work with all state and territory leaders, regardless of their political persuasion, to advance Australia's common interest for the benefit of all. Now, as the pandemic has so forcefully reminded us, our togetherness is underpinned by our universal public health system. Perhaps the greatest lesson we can take from these last two years is what a grave mistake it would be to take our public health system and Medicare for granted. Right now, our health workers are paying the price for some of the most serious, 
public policy failures that our country has ever seen. They are overworked. They are exhausted. We might roll our eyes about wearing a mask to the shops or to the National Press Club. They suit up in full PPE for 10 hour shifts. Like firefighters during the black summer, they put their own wellbeing on the line for their fellow Australians. And they're doing it every day. They embody the best of the Australian spirit. We owe it to them to study what the pandemic has revealed about the vulnerabilities of our public health system and strengthen it for the future. At the heart of it all is Medicare, a proud Australian achievement. Medicare is part of who we are. It makes our way of life possible. With its green and gold, it is the most patriotic piece of plastic that you can have in your wallet. Medicare was established by the Hawke government, building on years of work by Bill Hayden. Bob Hawke's government never hid behind the cowardly pretense of getting out of the way. They knew that good governments made the way. Bob's first instinct was to bring Australians together. Like, under him, Labor built Medicare not just as a safety net, but as a conscious act of nation building. Right now, we could strengthen both the safety net and our sense that we are all in this together by making rapid antigen tests available free to every Australian through Medicare. And that is what we should do. That is what a Labor government would have done at this moment, because Labor will always strengthen Medicare. We know there is nothing more central to our families, our communities, our schools and our economy than our health. A Labor government will deal with the damage inflicted by nine long years of neglect from this Liberal National Government. Protecting the health of Australians will be a defining issue in the upcoming election. And a critical choice will be this. Who do you trust to keep Medicare safe? Australians know where Labor stands. Labor built Medicare. Labor has always fought for Medicare and only Labor will protect Medicare. The past two years have been hard for all Australians. But I think all parents know that our children have done it especially tough. Remote learning, exam chaos, cancelled sport, and now the delays in vaccine supply have turned what should have been some of the best years of their lives into a cascade of stress and uncertainty. Some children have fallen behind academically and many are struggling with their mental health. And so many are just missing their mates. Parents are stressed from homeschooling, anxious about the weight the pandemic has put on their children's shoulders as well as their own. Over the past two years, time-starved parents put aside their own needs to support their children. Homes have been reconfigured into classrooms while parents sit with the quiet heartbreak of knowing this wasn't the childhood that they had hoped to give their precious children. They want to do the right thing. They want to keep their children safe. They want to make the best choice. They're looking for guidance from their federal government, but they're waiting in vain for Mr Morrison to come good on his vows. The man who stood before the country and promised a national plan for getting our children back to school, but didn't deliver one. He promised a national approach in which his government would work with the states. Instead, he did what he always does. He palmed off his share of the work to the states. Now, the states have done a great job in picking up the slack from the slackers government in living memory. But this is not how it is meant to be. Like a heart that decided to give itself a bypass, this government has decided to outsource responsibility for the fulfilment of its core obligations to the Australian people. It has run from its responsibilities to schools for nine long years, ever since Tony Abbott's horror first budget in 2014. Education is fundamental 
and essential to the jobs, productivity and prosperity of the future. And education is the biggest and most powerful weapon we have against disadvantage. I've always seen it as one of the great divides in Australian politics. Labor sees education as about creating opportunity. The Liberals see it as about entrenching privilege. A great distinction that the Australian people understand. It's why Labor remains committed, working with state and territory governments to getting every school to 100% of its fair funding level. And it's why today I'm announcing Labor's plan to help our schools and students bounce back. Our plan starts with the student wellbeing boost. It will provide funding for school activities that get children back on track. This could mean more funding for school counsellors and psychologists, and for camps, excursions, sporting and social activities that improve children's wellbeing. Every Australian school stands to benefit from this investment. And the schools themselves will decide how to use the extra money to best help their students. Our plan will fund a free mental health check tool. Schools could choose to use this to help quickly identify students who may need extra support. Our plan will direct the Education Department to conduct an urgent review of the impact of COVID on students with disability so that they get the support that they need. These children have been amongst the most vulnerable during this pandemic and they deserve a government that prioritises their protection along with their education. The other element of our plan is a schools upgrade fund, which will provide much needed support for improving ventilation in schools and creating outdoor learning areas. Both are key to managing the spread of COVID, just as they will be valuable for schools in a post-COVID world as well. This is something that the Morrison government should have already been doing to make sure schools are safe for our kids and teachers to return to. And not just for this term. Chief Medical Officer Paul Kelly tells us that COVID will be with us for some time, so we need to act and adapt. That means making our schools safer and better prepared for what's ahead. Mr Morrison never thinks as far ahead as next week. But the very business of a Labor government is to plan for the future. This is what good government does, a plan to head instead of waiting for a crisis before acting and then doing too little too late. It's one more pandemic lesson Mr Morrison hasn't learnt, but we have. Throughout the pandemic, Labor has developed a series of plans that share a common spirit to avoid repeating the mistakes of the present and allow us to build the very best version of Australia possible. To imagine a better future and then set about creating it. COVID has made it clear that being at the end of a global supply chain is a precarious place to be. We must be a country that manufactures things here our plan for a future made in Australia with our national reconstruction fund at its heart will propel our growing self-sufficiency. It will work alongside our plans for secure Australian jobs and a better life for working families to give Australians the tools that they need to shape the lives they want and deserve. We've already announced a number of key policies that set us on this path. Our Buy Australian plan, because government should back our businesses, our creation of Jobs and Skills Australia and our Made in Australia Skills Plan, offering free TAFE places in areas of skills shortages, because these shortages are hampering our recovery and wasting the potential of our people. Our plan for secure work, because casual jobs disappeared without warning during the pandemic, and it simply isn't the Australian way to leave each other so vulnerable. Our cheaper childcare plan, because working families need the support, especially women. It will give families more choice, it will strengthen the economy, it will be good for future generations. Our long-standing plan 
for the MBN because high speed internet as originally conceived by Labor is vital to work, school and family life. And our disaster ready fund because Australians deserve a government that looks forward and plans to mitigate the impact of natural disasters. Our plans add up to a better future in which Australia stands on our own two feet, self-reliant and self-assured. A country that embraces its place in Asia, the fastest growing region of the world in human history, forging deeper relationships in the region as the tyranny of distance gives way to the privilege of proximity. A country that is smart, innovative and adaptive, where businesses find a partner in a resolutely pro-growth, pro-employment, pro-investment government. A country with secure, good paying work because a job is about so much more than a wage. It's about your identity. It's about the community in which you live. It's about connection and giving your family the standard of life you aspire to. A country with world-class healthcare, education and childcare so that at every stage of life, our people have all the opportunities and tools they need to succeed. A country that treats its natural environment as a national asset to be protected, not only because it supports communities and local economies, but because of our moral obligation to preserve our land and water for future generations. I also see us as a country that uses its abundant natural resources to drive new industries and become a renewable energy superpower, creating jobs as power prices fall and writing a new chapter in Australia's proud energy story. Our Powering Australia plan will reduce Australia's emissions by 43% by 2030, putting us on track for net zero by 2050. It's a plan with economic growth at its heart. Over 600,000 jobs created. $52 billion of private sector investment, spurring new industries and cutting power bills by $275 by 2025 for the average family. Unlike Mr Morrison's glossy pamphlet, Powering Australia is underpinned by the most extensive, independent, expert modelling ever done for any policy by any opposition. Our plan has the backing of the Business Council of Australia, the Australian Industry Group, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the ACTU, the National Farmers Federation and a range of non-government organisations. Pretty broad spread. That is just one practical example of how I will bring Australians together, united by a common vision and a national partnership for progress. We can finally Put the climate wars behind us. Setting Australia on a path to a better future is not just about what we do, it also matters how we do it. Now, it was here at the National Press Club that Paul Keating first said, if you change the government, you change the country. My team and I want to change the government and we want to change the way government operates and the way government is perceived. I don't expect to make Australians fall in love with question time. But I do want more people to have greater faith in the integrity of its parliament and its representatives. Australian democracy is a great national achievement, but our system is no more immune to the threat of extremism and polarisation, corrosive influence of corruption and cynicism than other democracies around the world, many of whom are grappling with these very challenges. Now, the best way to make democracy stronger is to make government work better. And that's why I'll advocate for federation reform with greater cooperation between the Commonwealth and the states to be true to that vision of Australia, so much more than the sum of its parts. And to put it really simply, in our first term, we will have, not just promise, we will have a national anti-corruption commission, one with teeth, to restore faith in government and trust in our public officials. We will end this government's culture of rorts because public money should not be splashed around in cynical vote-buying exercises. 
And just as I want to encourage the Commonwealth and state governments to work together better, I want to encourage business and unions to work together because ultimately they share the same interests. A stronger economy, increased productivity, more good jobs. We can create a better deal for workers and grow our economy at the same time with leadership that brings both together. For our country to advance together as one, we must advance equality for women. We need to respect women across all elements of our culture, at work, at home, in schools and in our community. Women's safety must be an absolute national priority. And on her final day as Australian of the Year, I want to take a moment to thank Grace Tame for her quite extraordinary courage and her fierce advocacy. Grace, you've inspired countless Australians and you've earned enormous respect. The events that occurred here, here. Now, the events that occurred in Parliament, not just in recent times, but were made public in recent times, they constituted a powerful wake-up call. But we've had so many wake-up calls, we have no excuse to wait for another. Every time I look around our caucus room and see my colleagues, such as those who are here today, Tanya Plibersek, Linda Burney, Katie Gallagher, Christina Keneally, Michelle Rowland, Christy McBain, I'm reminded of a simple, powerful truth, that our country will be so much closer to what it should be when women enjoy true equality and when our parliament reflects the population with 50% women's representation. We cannot look to our future without also reflecting on the past, including injustice for First Nations people. Until a nation acknowledges the full truth of its history, it will be burdened by its unspoken weight. We must acknowledge the wrongs, learn from them, and look for ways of healing. Truth-telling can be confronting, but it not, need not be grounds for conflict. We should come to this process not armed for battle in cultural war, but with an open mind, and far more importantly, an open heart. With the lessons of our history and our enduring Australian values, we can forge an inclusive, sustainable and fair social compact. And a key part of that is to keep heading down the path to become a country deeply proud of being home to the oldest continuous cultures on earth, a nation that takes up the Uluru Statement from the heart and its gracious call uh, done so generously for voice, treaty and truth, a powerful and inspiring new chapter in a 60,000 year story. In conclusion, can I say that this crisis has shown we are stronger together but that truth is older and runs deeper than this pandemic. Tommy Wren was the closest person in my life I had to a father figure. He fought in World War II and he spent most of it as a prisoner of war. He always said that his fellow Australian prisoners survived because of a simple code. The healthy looked after the sick, the strong looked after the weak, and the young looked after the old. To me, that's always been the best of Australia, the best of our culture. And those are the values I want to bring to the job of Prime Minister. Leadership that brings people together in a spirit of compassion and decency. A government that seeks to unite the country, that earns the respect of Australians by treating them with respect, by dealing with them truthfully and by taking responsibility. One day, the COVID-19 pandemic will be written about in the past tense, and we all hope that that day is very soon. By then I know that, as Australians, we will have done so much more than get back on our feet. Beyond the recovery, I see renewal and I see rejuvenation. I see an Australia rebuilding on the foundation of its people's greatest strengths and best qualities. An Australia that is worthy of our people and their potential. 
an Australia where no one is held back and no one is left behind. Our best days are ahead of us. Together we will get out of the pandemic and chart a path to them. I thank you for your attention today. Well, thanks, Mr Albanese. Um, you've talked about the role of the federal government and the fact that th this government has stepped back from it. Uh, I just wondered if we could uh, investigate what you uh, mean by that in that area of health. You've talked about the importance of uh, Medicare and often we talk about the importance of frontline health, the frontline health workforce. But also, I think what's shown up in this pandemic is a lack of a proper infrastructure of both policy advice and service delivery at the federal level. And uh, as a test for how you might do it differently, you mentioned free rats tests. How would that actually work? How would you actually physically make rats tests free? How would you distribute them? What role would the federal government have that it doesn't have now? Other national governments have purchased rapid antigen tests for distribution. Uh, what occurred here, even in recent times, it, and I found the announcement extraordinary, after uh, the government said that pharmacies would provide uh, free rapid antigen tests for concession card holders, they then told pharmacies that they were on their own getting them, which is one of the reasons why they're not available. You actually need to take responsibility for that. And I've been approached by companies, for example, there's one uh, that uh, could provide and they've been trying to get the government uh, to buy en masse up to, we're talking in the hundreds of millions uh, available each month for $3.25, they tell me $4, including freight. Crickets, they hear from this government. There are so many occasions whereby the government just makes an announcement and then that's done. It's like the, the box is ticked and they move on. We actually need a government with follow through, a government that plans, a government that puts in place structures. That's not to underestimate the challenge, which is there to rebuild the public service, which has been gutted over the last nine years and to rebuild its capacity. Um. I'm tempted to ask another question, but I'm about to say to my colleagues if we could observe the one question per journalist rule. <laughs> I've got to be good. Uh, first question is from David Crow. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Mr Albanese, for your speech. David Crow from the Age of Melbourne and from the Sydney Morning Herald. And I think it's a follow-up question anyway, Laura. It's basically on free rats. It's one of the issues at the moment. We've all got family members and friends who are looking for rats out there. Now, you're offering free rats and you're saying that a Labor government would learn the lessons from the pandemic by planning better. But what exactly is your plan? I mean, free rats for everybody, all the time, anywhere. Do you actually propose that you'd have to have some kind of control on how many people could get? I'm not asking for a costing that you've got from the Parliamentary Budget Office, just the practicalities of how many rats yeah. you think you could get and how many people could get from a pharmacy or elsewhere? We know that there are, there are two questions. One is that, that rats are available from overseas, but they're also available here. I find it remarkable that Australian companies are manufacturing rats, sending them overseas because they haven't got approval here and they can't get purchased here by the federal government. It, it, it is just remarkable that uh, in, in my local community and so many as I travelled uh, 10 days from Cairns right through to Maryborough in every one of those 20 Queensland towns and cities I visited in none of them was there appropriate availability and the specific circumstances are that for example people working in medical centres should be available uh, should have access to a rat each and every day if that was the health recommendation. For others, by doing it through the Medicare system, just like that's what they're doing with the concession card holders, you can control how many there are. Um, and, and you wouldn't want people having them just for the sake of them, to keep it. Uh, don't want to channel Barnaby Joyce, but that was just a nonsense. Suggesting that the problem in supply of rats was because of hoarding. 
The problem is one of supply. That's the problem. So would you ration the rats? For uh, appropriately based upon health advice. For some people, if you're working in a medical centre, you need access to testing each and every day because people are coming in. If you're working, with due respect, in the Bureau of the, uh, the Age and the, and the Herald in, in Parliament House, you probably don't need to test yourself every day. So a bit of common sense could be applied here. It's not beyond the wit of the government, well, a, a government, uh, that was competent to work this out. Uh, the Medicare schedule provides a record. That's the, whole, that's the whole reason why you would do it through the Medicare system. That little card provides you with security as an individual. It also provides the Australian people with security as well. Michelle Grattan. Michelle Grattan from uh, The Conversation. Mr Albanese, there have been widespread calls for a Royal Commission to examine Australia's handling of COVID, especially to look to lessons to be learned for the future. If you win the election, will you hold such a Royal Commission? And if so, would you be willing to consult with the opposition leader to get agreement on terms of reference and commissioners to try to uh, reduce partisan elements in the exercise? And if you're not willing to commit today, could you say why? Um, because I lead a process in the best traditions of Bob Hawke of Shadow Cabinet. That's why I don't make commitments uh, at, uh, at national press clubs that haven't been through our process to answer that one. Uh, but it is, it is beyond doubt that you will need an assessment. Whether that be a Royal Commission or some form of inquiry, you, uh, that will need to happen. And the best way to ensure support is to have more consultation uh, with, uh, with the opposition uh, in general. I, I adopt that principle. I adopted it when I was a minister and when I was leader of the government in the House of Representatives. So one of the things that I say to people is that the benefit of uh, having experience in government is you don't have to just take what I said, have a look at what I did. I was leader of the government in the House of Representatives in a majority government. One of the reasons why, if you talk to some of the crossbenchers who chose Julia Gillard as Prime Minister after 2010, uh, was that crossbenchers in that parliament uh, knew that they got treated with respect. That's just the way I operate. It's the way I've operated within the party, treating my own party with respect, and it's the way I would operate across the parliament. Isn't it uh, the case that you... I mean, haven't you considered the possibility of a Royal Commission into, into the, uh, the result? We, we have considered it, but whilst we're in uh, the heat of the pandemic, our priority at the moment is seeing us through the pandemic. So when you get through, or when you get towards the end, then you'd give consideration to that would be appropriate. But it is appropriate at the moment, just as we are here today, with these practical suggestions developed through our processes led by Tanya Plibersek, our Shadow Education Minister, of how do we deal with the problems that are there right now. There are parents watching this at home who are worried about their kids right now. So we're dealing with, if you like, the the urgent necessities of the one, whilst trying to both create and anticipate the future. And we'll continue to do that. Phil Curry. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Mr Albanese, Phil Curry from the <laughs> AFR. Can I just take you back to your speech? You mentioned federation reform, but no detail. Um, can I ask you what you have in mind? Are you, And specifically, would you be looking like Tony Abbott, as was the last Prime Minister, have a crack at this, at the tax system, um, at duplication in health and education, and would you be, will you keep or change the National Cabinet arrangement? Could you address those specifically, please? He managed to slip in more than one there, Phil. Well done. Um, Composite question. <laughs> look, um, uh, one of the reasons why um, there's less specifics there is it's a matter of you can't say you want to work with the states and territories and then impose things uh, from the Commonwealth. But what you can do is engage in a spirit of goodwill and can I say that I've spoken to premiers not just Labor premiers about this um, on a off the record basis and uh, you'd expect uh, me to do that. 
Um, we need a clearer delineation of who's responsible for what. Even at the moment in aged care during this pandemic. Now the Commonwealth funds, regulates, the, the full bit. And yet what we've had is a Commonwealth government uh, that attempted to uh, shun off responsibility uh, to the states. Uh, even aged care facilities can't get enough, at the moment PPE, can't get enough um, uh, rapid antigen tests for their staff. Um, you had to quote a, a former New South Wales Premier from the other side, Mike Baird, uh, who leads one of Australia's lead, leading aged care um, operations, uh, someone who I have respect, I've spoken to him directly about this. Uh, he's called for the use of the Australian Defence Force to make beds and to do the essentials in aged care facilities because the system isn't working. So I, I think working those things through it is, never, is never easy, but as a federal minister in terms of transport, uh, to use something that, that's not sexy, but uh, we moved from 23 national transport regulators with different rules across rail, heavy vehicles and maritime, down to three, with consistency across the board, with a benefit to the national economy of $30 billion over 20 years. That's microeconomic reform, that's productivity. And it just seems to me that my entire time I've been either a participant or an observer of politics. We've seen more national consistency, that's been the trend, ever since particularly the Keating's National Competition Council reforms. In the recent times we've seen a drift away from that. We have National Cabinet where the state premiers all come, they tell each other what they're doing and then Scott Morrison announces it and pretends that, that there's some uniformity there. Um, we need to do better than that. Uh, but one way that we need to do better than that is by being upfront and not saying something in the room and something different outside the room, uh, by not uh, attacking some premiers on the basis of uh, what their political background is, while the same thing's happening in other states, and that's OK. You need consistency, and we need to work those issues through. If we do, there are massive efficiencies. Uh, we need to get back to the growth agenda and the microeconomic reform and productivity agenda. And part of the way that you do that is through federation reform. Uh, the duplication that's there is, is a, a problem for our economy, but more importantly during this pandemic, it's been a source of enormous frustration from people as they look at buck passing, and we need to do better. Max Madison. Mr Albanese, Max Madison from the Australian. Just on tax. Um, you have not stated your position to Labor's 2019 policy to implement a minimum tax rate on um, discretionary trust, despite it being discussed by your strategic policy review committee. Will you revive the policy ahead of the election, or will you commit to making no changes to the current rules when it comes to trusts? Well, we, we, we announce our tax policy when we announce them. And uh, I, I have done, stood up here after the review and said that no policy is our policy until we make it. I've made that, that very clear um, all the way through. So it, it reminds me of the, um, uh, the debate that I used to get from one of your colleagues about, what's your 2030 target? Will you do it? Will it be the same? Will it, you know, sorry, but we, we decide our policy and when we announce it. So you won't categorically rule it out? And when we announce it. But you get into a game then to be frank, you get into a game of then will you rule out something else that you might like to just make out up. It's not our policy. It's not our policy until we announce something. And uh, we'll work all of those issues through. I've been very transparent about what our policy process is. And can I say this? Um, we have announced, you know, it's a bit like, um, you know, the, the Monty Python sketch, you know, <laughs> What have the Romans ever done for us? People say, where's your policy? Well, apart from, this is since December, an expanded MBN, a climate policy that is comprehensive and fully costed, 465,000 free TAFE places, 20,000 university places in additional, a policy of 500 new community workers to deal with domestic violence, a shipping policy that includes a strategic national fleet, high-speed rail being a priority, a, from Newcastle to Sydney as the first leg, a 
policy of uh, disaster preparedness using the ERF, a Great Barrier Reef Fund policy, and additional uh, Indigenous ranges. That's since December. That's what we've done. You know what the government's announced in new policy for the next term since December? Zero. Crickets. Catherine Murphy. Hello, Mr. Anthony. God, happy new year. Hello, Mr. Albanese. It's Catherine Murphy from Guardian Australia. Um, I just want to bring you back to health in your speech uh, and Labor's commitments to Medicare. Obviously, that involves public health and hospital funding. Last October, uh, health ministers from all the states wrote to Greg Hunt and basically told him that there was an effective underpayment in the current National Hospitals Agreement because COVID has significantly increased service delivery costs in hospitals. So I'm not asking for the detail or the number. I'm just asking you a very simple question, which is a yes or no answer. Will Labor try. provide more, more funding for public hospitals? Labor will always be better on health and education than our opponents. Is that yes? That's the answer I gave. Labor will always be better on health and education than our opponents. We've already announced a range of policies out there and there'll be more to come. Andrew Probin. Andrew Probin from the ABC. You've talked about the Federation, albeit um, uh, so vaguely, uh, but one of the things about the Federation under a pandemic has been that uh, you've been cast often to the shadows in political debate that people might be more likely to know the premiers of other states than they are to know the leader of the opposition federally, the alternative prime minister. So for all those people who do know Mark McGowan more than they know you, who is Anthony Albanese? <laughs> <laughs> Anthony Albanese is the uh, son of a single mum who grew up in council housing in Camperdown. She was an invalid pensioner. As I grew up, I understood the impact that government had, can have, on making a difference to people's lives, and in particular, to opportunity. I had the security because it was public housing of a roof over my head, so I didn't have to worry about that. Until there was a change of government in Sydney City Council, and a conservative group got control who thought that uh, the council shouldn't be involved in public housing. So I tried to sell my house. My first campaign, I was 12 years old. We organised a rent strike. We took petitions around to everyone. That was my experience of that, that drove me. That was my first political campaign. And by the way, we won. <laughs> we got back in terms of a Labor controlled council led by people like Robert Tickner and everyone who'd been on the rent strike had their back rent written off too, which was a good thing because it taught a lesson for those people who weren't part of the rent strike. <laughs> Solidarity works. And then, and then my, mum, my mum was crippled up with rheumatoid arthritis. So I lived by myself um, for a long period of time. And I'd encourage people to read Karen Middleton's book <laughs> down the front here, telling it straight, a title made, I hope, about the way that I engage in politics. I tell it straight. Uh, I live by myself. Uh, it's meant that I'm resilient and I'm tough. If people think I'll go and, you know, into a corner uh, during the upcoming fight, they're very wrong. They're very wrong. Just watch. It gave me a determination each and every day to help the people like I was growing up to have a better life. And I think that's what Australians want, very simply. And no one does it on their own. I had neighbours who'd cook me meals at night uh, so that I got a proper meal, meat and veggies. They looked after, but they had nothing. One of the things that I've learned in life too is that it's often the poorest people, the most working class people. One of the reasons why I'm a supporter unashamed of the trade union movement is that it's often those people who have less who give more. That's me. Kieran Gilbert. Thank you, 
Laura, thank you. Mr Albanese, as you know, it's been a rocky th a few years, to say the least, when it comes to relations with China. If you win government, do you believe there can be a reset in relations with Beijing? And what would be the first thing you would do in office? Would you send the foreign minister to Beijing, for example? Well, I think uh, the starting point is that whoever's in government, it will be a difficult relationship. It will be difficult because the posture of China has changed. It is China that has changed, not Australia that has changed. And uh, that needs to be acknowledged and we need to adjust accordingly. Uh, China's more forward-leaning uh, in, uh, in the region and that requires a, an adjustment in our approach. Uh, so I don't, uh, I, I don't blame uh, the government and never have for the current circumstances. Uh, one of the things that, that I would hope for though is that you can have an, an Australian policy that would be exactly the same on the Uyghurs, on, on Hong Kong, on Taiwan, on the South China Sea, on human rights, uh, but still have an economic relationship that the Howard government had and that, that is important in the region. Uh, the rise of China is a fact of our times and China deserves a great deal of credit for lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. They have achieved that. It's a great economic achievement, the like of which uh, we haven't seen ever in, in human history. But that presents us with a, a challenge politically, uh, but also, of course, it's an opportunity for our trading relationship. Doesn't mean that we abandon uh, diplomacy. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the US administration put it best uh, when they classified as competition without catastrophe. We do have competition in our region. And we as a democratic nation stand with other democracies. We stand up for our values and we should be prepared to uh, not compromise on them at all. But we should also not engage in, in catastrophe. Uh, we should uh, work as much as possible through multilateral organisations. Uh, I see our three policies of foreign, three pillars of foreign policy as being our alliance with the United States, engagement with regional partners and engagement in multilateral forums, such as uh, the, the United Nations and its bodies. But one of the problems we've had, I think, in the region is it was very short-sighted for this government to withdraw uh, from uh, aid in the Pacific in the way that they did. If uh, Australia and democratic nations withdraw, guess what? There are others who might want to fill that gap. And we need uh, to ensure that we act in a way that's in our national interest uh, going forward. I think we can do that, but I don't, uh, I don't argue uh, that a change of government will simply change uh, the relationship because that's just something that we have to deal with. But we have to deal with it in a mature way, uh, not by being uh, provocative for the sake of it to make a domestic political point. We need to understand that there are domestic consequences uh, as well. Thank you. We're getting close to time, Mr Albanese, but uh, we might keep going if that's okay sure, with you. Sure. Anna Henderson. Thank you. Anna Henderson, SBS World News. Uh, Mr Albanese, just on Ukraine, obviously the situation is very tense. Do you agree with the approach being taken at the moment by the US and the UK in rhetoric and action? And if you were Prime Minister and you were asked, would you agree to provide military support? Well, we haven't been asked and it's not appropriate to deal in hypotheticals either uh, because what uh, Australia is doing, and this is a bipartisan position. I heard uh, Maurice Payne on the radio this morning. There was nothing she said that I disagree with. And there's nothing that Penny Wong has put out, that I've put out, uh, that uh, isn't consistent with that, which is that we've been asked uh, by Ukraine as uh, to provide assistance against uh, potential cyber attacks, and Australia has agreed to do that. That's appropriate. Uh, we've called for uh, the safety of our own citizens to be the first priority, and that's appropriate as well. 
and we've called for uh, Russia to respect Ukraine's sovereignty and to, for a de-escalation is what we call for. This is an example of whereby uh, diplomacy, I, as I said, I have no criticism of, of Maurice Payne at, at all. I agree with everything she said this morning. Diplomacy needs not to deal with hypotheticals and talking things up, what if this happens? What you need to do, leadership is sometimes about uh, just saying people need to cool it, essentially, is the message. We need de-escalation. And that is, uh, I think, uh, appropriate at this point in time. And I certainly hope that that occurs. And on the position being taken by the United States? Which one? <laughs> which, well, which on, on, on the handling of this by the President. Well, <laughs> that's a very broad statement that you make, with respect. Um, President Biden said a range of things there. The US is providing support. The US is calling for a de-escalation. Uh, the US is providing uh, some uh, hardware support uh, to the Ukraine, and that's a decision for the United States. Thank you. Lani Scar. Lani Scar from the West Australian. Mr Albanese, I've just gotten the results of a poll that will be in our paper tomorrow by Painted Dog that shows 51... I might be online in a... About... Maybe. Um, that shows 51% of West Australians believe Mark McGowan could have done more to prepare to stick to his pledge to open the border on February 5. And only 28% believe there is nothing more he could have done and his decision was sound. You backed in Mark McGowan after his press conference last week and you said Mark McGowan has done the right thing by WA, which is keeping their health OK, which is a precondition for keeping their economy OK. Do you still believe that's the case when 51% of, of West Australians think more could have been done? And do you think he could have done more to prepare to open the border? I've backed in every Premier. <coughs> and uh, in Bass electorate on Saturday, I was asked a number of questions about Premier Gutwein. And I said I supported his decision based upon the health advice as well that he's getting. <coughs> I think one of the things that has happened during this, um, during this period didn't happen at the beginning. At the beginning, the National Cabinet, if you look at National Cabinet coming together, they all went out there. There was a particular Sunday whereby uh, then Premier uh, Berejiklian and Daniel Andrews made it clear they had a different position on schools to the federal government. And from that point on, the, 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 the thing just drifted away to the point whereby now, if anyone thinks there's national consistency, then uh, that's not a position I share. Um, but one of the reasons why it's drifted away is this sort of game of uh, the Prime Minister being critical of uh, Premiers uh, selectively, even though they're doing the same thing. I recall the, you can get a cup of coffee in, uh, in Queensland, uh, or you, you need to to um, log on uh, in, in order to get a cup of coffee in Queensland. It was exactly the same rules in New South Wales. One of the things I do know about WA under Premier McGowan is that WA's economy has been the strongest in Australia, is that WA's exports have kept the national economy going, is that people in WA have been able to have dinner, they've been able to associate and go to each other's houses, They've been able to go to the pub, they've been able to play footy, and they hosted the grand final last year. So I'm not about second guessing uh, Premier McGowan and his decision making process. I make no apologies for saying that I think he's done a good job. But you're trying to secure their vote, so do you agree with them or do you agree with Mark McGowan? I, I, I don't. You're the commentator, and I'll leave you to make the commentating. Um, what I agree with is that Mark McGowan has done an outstanding job as the Premier of Western Australia. Karen Barlow. Uh, Karen Barlow, Canberra Times. Um, you said in your speech, you say, the future that you're working towards will be demonstrated to Australians within the first term of a Labor government. Uh, you also spoke of uh, the desire to deliver the legacies that you want to Australians. Really, what can be delivered uh, tangibly within 100 days? What's ready to roll if Labor is elected? Well, I'm not going to do the 100-day uh, game. Um, 
what can be done and what I said in our first term is that we can reform the whole childcare system, for example, uh, so that you have more affordable childcare and so that at the same time you move towards, and we've said we'll do it, uh, that change will come in on in the first, uh, after a year, and then we will have a review as well by the PC about uh, whether we move then towards universal affordable provision. Uh, so that's an example of a change. In the first uh, term as well, we will have established a National Reconstruction Fund, $15 billion. It'll be out there supporting new industries. And that will work in conjunction, obviously, uh, with our Powering the Nation Fund. We'll have our, our $20 billion plan to fix electricity transmission. Uh, the work's been done on that by IEMO with their integrated systems plan. Uh, this is low-hanging fruit that you can achieve in your first term. And we can change the trajectory so that we're headed towards 43% by 2030 reduction. And so that we once again are going to international conferences, uh, not being the naughty kids in the corner with Brazil and Saudi Arabia. Uh, Australia can re-bring respect to our position on climate change, on gender issues and, and women's safety. Uh, we've said 500 additional workers. Uh, you know, one of the tragedies of the pandemic has been the increase in violence towards women and children. Uh, it's a national scourge. We can have leadership on that. We can adopt immediately the Respect at Work report. How hard is that? To adopt the Respect at Work report that's been sitting there, they didn't even respond to for more than a year. Uh, there are a range of changes uh, that we can make uh, in our first term across the economy, social and environmental. Uh, we've put time frames on the whole range of things uh, that uh, will be there. I want an advance as well in our first term. We will have a National Anti-Corruption Commission. We will have a Royal Commission into RoboDebt and the scandals that occurred there. Uh, we, have, we will be rolling out the expansion of the National Broadband Network uh, to uh, over a million homes and businesses. In addition, we will have five-year funding for ABC and SBS and we will restore the ABC's funding that was cut by this government. Um, Mr Albanese, Dominic Giannini from the Australian Associated Press. Um, given you've promised to legislate net zero, how will you enforce it and will you strengthen the safeguard mechanism such as expanding it to cover more industries or lowering the baseline? Uh, no to the latter. Uh, we think that uh, the current industries which are there provide certainty uh, going forward. Uh, so we won't include, there isn't a single business uh, that uh, is currently not covered by the safeguards mechanism that will be covered. Uh, it's a straightforward plan and uh, it's one uh, that will work and that's been fully modelled and we put it all out there. Our plan didn't have a little provision, a little asterisk which is in their pamphlet of uh, stuff that we've made up and that doesn't exist yet. <laughs> and by the way, it doesn't even add up to net zero anyway by 2050 at the end of it all. We've put out a comprehensive plan and I reckon if I had have stood up here um, at any of the previous, I think this is probably number four speech at the National Press Club as Labor leader, and said, or in response to any of the questions, like the tax questions, what are you doing about 2030? And said, well, what we're going to do is I'm going to have a plan um, and it'll be endorsed by the ACTU, it'll be endorsed by conservation groups, mainstream conservation groups, uh, it will be endorsed by the Business Council, ACI, AIG, and by the way, the National Farmers Federation will give it a shout out as well. I, I would have been laughed out. You, you would have, any journo would have said, you know, you're kidding me, that's, that's a bit ambitious. Well, we did it. We did it. And we did it fully costed. And I didn't come here and say in advance, by the way, the reason why we're doing it is because we want to wait until the US elections. I remember Phil Curry asking me, a question outside Parliament House. And I said, there are two events. The US elections will change the climate debate globally, and it did. And secondly is Glasgow. It was appropriate to wait to Glasgow. It was appropriate to look at what they'd put out,
before we put out ours. Because one of the things I've been determined to do as well, and it goes to the sort of theoretical questions that I get asked from time to time uh, by, uh, by members of the gallery, is that I've been determined to give one answer. Not to give an answer in 2019, and then come back in 2020 and say, well, now this has changed, and then give a different answer in 2021. When we announce our policy, it's a policy for the election. And when I stood here at my first address to the National Press Club, I said, as I said on the day that I became Labor leader, I'm not about tactics. I'm not about what happens in a week or what happens in a month. I'm about, I've said this before to, to many of you, I'm about two dates. One is election day. What's our offer to the Australian people? We know this government's pretty incompetent and pretty dishonest, frankly. Uh, but what's our offer? What's our alternative? I understand we've got to have an alternative offer. We've been putting that out there very consciously. And when we make a commitment, we mean it. It's costed. We do the detail. We work through. And just because it's not um, a source of conflict doesn't mean it's not serious. To my mind, it means the opposite. It means it is serious. We've talked it through in advance. We've thought about uh, the problems that might be there and we've dealt with them. But you, you've announced this policy, so what's your yeah. one answer about how you're going to enforce it? I, I'm not sure what you mean how you, you're going you, to You said it. you're going to legislate we, net zero. We will have, yeah, you have legislation mm. and the legislation include, well, the legislation for the safeguards mechanism is there. It was introduced by Tony Abbott. Matt it was Keller. Tony Abbott's legislation and Tony Abbott's legislation uh, provides, for, provides for the companies that are a part of the safeguard mechanism. What hasn't happened, what hasn't happened is that the Climate Change Authority hasn't put forward uh, an oversight of it that ensures it's consistent with net zero by 2050. What we did wasn't to adopt 43% by 2030 and then decide how we're going to get there. What we did was say, these are the mechanisms we're going to do. Rewiring the nation to fix electricity transmission. Make electric vehicles cheaper. Fix the safeguard mechanism so it actually does what it was supposed to do and intended to do and, and reduce emissions. Community batteries. The range of policies that we've put forward in the Powering Australia plan are all there uh, for all to see, and it happens that that adds up through the Reputex modelling to 43% reduction by 2030, which is consistent with getting a net zero by 2050. Matt Killeran. Uh, Opposition Leader Matt Killeran with the Courier Mail. Um, over your leadership, you've changed or shifted the, the party's position with regards to the future of coal mining to be more consistent and, and following the lines of it will be determined by the international boardrooms rather than political decisions. Uh, when it comes to coal-fired power stations, over the next decade there will be closures of coal-fired power stations like your lawn in Victoria or Vales Point B in New South Wales. What do you say to those workers when it comes to the future of, and sustainability of their jobs? And will a uh, Albanese government consider intervening to, to keep those or extend the life of those stations uh, in, in a similar way to the federal, the Morrison government did with Liddell, if it's required for either the uh, sustainability of the power grid or their jobs? But the Morrison government didn't with Liddell, with respect. They talked about it. And then they did the opposite. That's right. And that's consistent with what they've done the whole way through because they got hit by reality and the market. So Liddell will shut uh, because uh, of the, the problems that are there because it's at the end of its life. And if you speak to people in the energy sector, including the head of energy security appointed by this government, uh, Kerry Schott, uh, Kerry Schott will tell you why Liddell couldn't have been uh, kept open. So, you know, that's one of the, the things I've avoided. Josh Frydenberg used to stand up in question time day after day and give speeches about Liddell. And, uh, it's a, you know, if uh, we, uh, we now say, what about Liddell? He doesn't talk about it anymore uh, because it's, uh, the, the opposite has happened. Our policy in terms of the modelling will have no impact 
on any of the time frames uh, for uh, the shift that is occurring under either government is occurring, the Dell shutting, uh, that is occurring. There are changes in our energy mix. There are changes in our energy mix because the cheapest form of new energy in Australia is uh, clean energy. I was at uh, Gladstone in your great state of Queensland uh, last week, last week, at uh, the Rio Tinto alumina refinery. They're looking at hydrogen, they're looking at ways in which they shift to clean energy. Uh, why? Uh, in, part, in part it's about uh, a message to their shareholders and all that, but the big driver is economics. They want the company and the business to be more efficient and to have lower bills. That's why they're doing it. Just as throughout uh, the whole country, you can visit factories anywhere and see solar panels on roofs, see batteries that are reducing power bills. The same reason why individuals are putting better than just about any country in the world, solar panels on their roofs. Some of them it might be because of climate change. But I'll tell you what the big driver is, they want to pay less in their power bills. That same logic is happening throughout the economy. Jade Galberger. Jade Galberger from the Herald Sun. You've been pretty critical about what you call the $1 trillion in Liberal debt racked up during the pandemic. Before the election, will you tell voters how you plan to pay back that debt? And do you think the budget can be repaired through productivity gains and economic growth, or will a Labor government cut spending? Well, it'd help if the government was trying to drive productivity growth. It'd help if they had a plan at all. My, my criticism of this government isn't that whoever is in government during a crisis would need to stimulate the economy, just like we did during the global financial crisis. At that time, the coalition spoke about record debt and they had all that nonsense rhetoric that now they'd like to forget. The problem with this government is that they've racked up a trillion dollars of debt and no legacy. Uh, the former Labor governments I was proud to serve in weren't perfect. But the legacy from the GFC included paid parental leave, included a national broadband network, fibre based, not copper based, included uh, more investment in urban public transport than all previous governments combined in the previous 107 years. It included rebuilding one third of the interstate rail freight network. It included bringing forward the completion of the Hume Highway and putting forward major benefits uh, on the Bruce and the Pacific. There are projects like Regional Rail Link in Victoria, uh, the largest ever single investment in a public transport project by any federal government in history. Where's the legacy? Car parks, sports rorts, you know, they've got $16 billion in decisions taken but not announced. That is, decisions taken to spend taxpayers' money that they won't tell the people watching this broadcast what it's going to be spent on. That's my criticism. This government have no credibility when it comes to economic management. Uh, I have a, a record of being able to manage a portfolio uh, and I had a substantial portfolio. Uh, at the end of the government, I was Minister for Infrastructure and Transport and Communications and all, all of those things. Um, whereby I've been opposition leader now for uh, three years. Um, they haven't um, managed to, to point to any, any, uh, any problems. Uh, this government have had $100 billion of new spending in two budgets that weren't even 12 months apart, and they cut the infrastructure investment by $4.2 billion in their last budget. That's the problem. So if you have uh, an end to waste, an end to mismanagement, you can actually make some measures towards budget repair. If you have economic growth uh, driven by higher wages as part of the problem that's there at the moment, yeah, you know, insecure work means that people aren't uh, in a position to, to uh, make contributions. Uh, if you have 
an economy uh, that is seeing new industries grow through our National Reconstruction Fund, through our action on power in the nation, uh, then you can turn around the economy. And that's our vision. Their vision is just, I'm not sure what it is, uh, more, more of the same. Uh, so we'll work those things through, uh, but I'm very confident uh, that our economic team as well, Katie Gallagher, uh, never lets a, 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 she, she comes along to these things so I don't make commitments that haven't been through processes. <laughs> and she's very good at it and, and uh, those people who watch her at the uh, Senate COVID committee will know that I'm justified in being intimidated by Katie <laughs> with regard to making commitments on the run. We make no apologies for that. We'll be responsible. You know, we, we've made no, um, you know, e easy oh, we'll just throw money everywhere, uh, commitments. Uh, we've made commitments and one of the things that my shadow cabinet know is if you want a commitment, show how there'll be payback as well. So childcare, for example. Uh, truth is, we costed that at $6.2 billion over the forwards. But every analysis says that every dollar you spend in childcare will increase the economic growth, will pay back by more than double. So they're the things that I'm looking for that actually grow the economy, not just things that are one off and are then gone. Uh, that's a part of how you build a legacy. Well, finally, Mr Albanese, uh, will you commit to debating the Prime Minister uh, during the election campaign, either here at the National Press Club or elsewhere? Uh, every day, every week, it's fine. Um, I can't get into debate, debate in the parliament. Um, it's, uh, it, there's never been a Prime Minister who's so shy uh, about having a, a debate. It's one of the things I spoke about today was about democracy. Um, you know, th this government have acted differently from that led by Tony Abbott, Malcolm Turnbull, John Howard, Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard. No other government shuts down debate the way that this one does and is so scared of having a debate. Uh, I, I am up for a debate here with the Prime Minister. I'm up for a debate on ABC, 7, 9, 10, Herald, West. You can all host. Guardian, everyone can host one. I'll, <laughs> I'll, turn, up, I'll turn up wherever they are. Um, we'll wait and see whether he turns up. I'll, I'm available next week, <laughs> by the way, when, when, when he turns up here. Um, you know, I think an election should be a contest of ideas. And I think the more debates, uh, the better. I suspect, though, given the letter that the National Secretary wrote to my National Secretary, Paul Erickson, which had an out clause in it, which meant that he could veto, they wanted a committee of, you know, 57 people to decide how the debates would happen and everyone gets to veto it. Uh, that they've set up a structure to avoid debates, not to have debates. And, and I think uh, there should be a bit of common sense. I uh, say unashamedly, uh, not just because where you work now, but in front of all your colleagues, I think the ABC should host a range of debates as our national broadcaster. Um, I think the National Press Club should host a debate, but I'm up for a debate uh, wherever. I've agreed to, here now, I've agreed to do one on Sky. Um, I'll, I'll debate him anywhere and debate on Andrew Bolt if he likes. Please thank the Leader of the Opposition. <laughs>